Hello and welcome to this tutorial of me painting a 6 by 6 inch plein air painting in gouache at Angel's Landing Hike. Now this hike was done at Zion National Park and let me just say that it was a freaking challenging hike. It was only 5.4 miles but carrying a heavy backpack with <laughs> Um, photography and gouache painting tools, plein air painting tools was not easy in the slightest. So I'm very lucky and happy that I made it to the top and I made it to the top just so I could do this painting. So you are in for a treat. So when I hit first started this painting, I thought it'd be too tired to even think, but it was still a really fun painting to paint. Now, right now, what you can see is me doing the block in stage. So in front of me, you can see the beautiful mountains and most of it is in shadow and it's, just, and it's in this beautiful rim light that I'm really excited to capture because that is one of my favorite types of lighting to paint. Right now, I'm using a one inch flat brush. I'm actually not sure what brand that is. That is actually some old brush I picked up somewhere. Um, but I always started with the flat brush and you'll hear me talk about this in most of my gouache tutorials because um, the flat brush is just a great brush to block in. You get those big graphic shapes, especially for something like rocks where um, it's not, maybe it's confusing for you to kind of break down into simple shapes. You know, it's, it's rather organic. There's lots of little crevices and the flat brush is just really great for that. Now, one thing I want to quickly mention is how I'm holding my brush. You can see I'm not holding it towards the tip where the brush is, but more towards the end, almost like a wand. And this actually gives me so much more mobility. And toning my canvas has pretty much become a habit for me. I always do it. And what I also did was I sketched um, a quick sketch first in a, with a red Le Pen. Uh, it's, it, bleed, it does bleed, but I do like it that it bleeds because it bleeds a nice warm color. So let's talk a little bit about color and transition into that. So what am I mixing for these shadows of these rocks? Um, on my palette, if I remember correctly, I have white, permanent yellow deep, yellow ochre, and lemon yellow. Those are my three types of yellows that I use when I have an expanded palette. Now, sometimes I will paint with a very stripped down primaries palette, but in this case, I kind of whipped out all the colors. Um, so those are my three yellows. I have cadmium red and alizarin crimson. I have a little bit of Holbein pink, brilliant pink in the top left corner. And I have ultramarine and sky blue. And I uh, forgot to mention, I also have burnt sienna. So right now for my shadow colors, uh, for in my rocks, I'm mixing a little bit of sky blue and a little bit of uh, burnt sienna. And one color I forgot to mention that's really important is cadmium orange. And I forgot to mention it because I actually don't use this color at all. But I found out that coming and hiking in Zion National Park, along with Bryce Canyon and the Grand Canyon, orange, cadmium orange was actually a very essential color that I needed to get the vibrancy in those rocks that I just couldn't quite get with red and yellow. So I actually ended up mixing this and you can see that mixing a little bit of warmth, that orange with the blue, which are compliments, it really off plays that nice vibration of warmer and cool. And I do this a lot uh, when I'm mixing colors. I love to mix compliments to together and because the shadow colors aren't that saturated, uh, mixing compliments together, a warmer and cooler color is how I do to get that, those warmer and cooler vibrations together. So what you see me doing now is that you can see I blocked out all the shadows, right? But since I've toned my canvas, uh, that essentially serves as the lighter shapes in my rocks that are catching the light. Uh, you can see a little bit of it in the, in the actual scenery behind me. So this is by toning my canvas, it gives a little bit of warmth and it actually is a faster way for me to start seeing my shadow and light shapes quite quickly. So now I can start to see the formation of the rocks, the shapes, the larger and smaller shapes that I might have, the grouping that I need to employ without actually yet touching my highlights, which I will do soon, but I haven't yet. I'm not going to keep it that warm color because that would just be too warm all the way and the sky is actually hitting the uh, light parts of the rocks which and the sky is a cool ambient light so it's the highlights aren't going to be super super warm like people uh think so right now i'm just kind of 
getting the whole block in it. I've kind of blocked in the ground, which is a luscious greenery on the on the in the valley down below. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on, but um, I'm trying to simplify it right now. Uh, and you can see that right now, I actually haven't painted the sky. I always forget to paint the sky. Uh, it's just a habit of mine, I guess. I, I focus on other things first because the sky is pretty just a one note. And so as long as I get the value right of the sky compared to everything else, I know I'm good to go. But I need to compare the sky to something. I need to compare the sky to the rocks that I blocked into the value of the rocks. So that's why I blocked my rocks in first so that I have something to uh, compare my sky to and therefore mix the correct value. So right now it's still called this a block in. Now you can see me sort of start to touch in still with the flat brush and just sort of start dabbling in some very delicate touches of those highlights, mixing a little bit of sky blue with white um, to tone down some areas a little bit. Now this is the part where it's very easy to mess up. Sometimes you can cover too much of what you had and it's like, no, keep the tone. Of, of, of your underpainting sometimes, or your tone of your painting, because those are beautiful, kind of beautiful seepage coming through uh, in your painting that you want to keep. And I made this mistake very early on uh, when I would start off gouache painting, I would cover my whole painting, even after I tone it, it was almost pointless toning my painting, and I just cover everything. It wasn't until a year in later that I, I realized, oh, there is such a merit to using that tone. And now I, I make sure that I employ that. So I'm still using my flat brush and I'm still in my block in phase. And you can see, I already feel like right now I've kind of lost a little bit of that structure and it's very easy to go back and forth like that where you build up structure, then you kind of start to lose it, then you build it up again. And painting is that whole kind of building, destroying, building, destroying, but the whole time, I like to look at it as a staircase, right? You're building, then you're sort of maybe falling flat, then you're building again, but the whole time it's an upward, uh, upward diagonal. At least we hope so, right? Not every painting is that case, of course. Uh, and now you can see actually that I have switched to my round brush. And the round brush, I will start to employ that sometimes early on and sometimes very later on. It, it really depends for each painting. Uh, I've come to love the round brush and I'm just sort of scumbling in right now some of the shadows that have uh, hit the valley. Now, I will say as I was painting, the shadow was drastically um, shifting. So by the time I was done, there was a huge shadow on the bottom right corner that was covering that whole area. When I first started the painting, that was not the case. So, you know, in planar painting, you often have to account for those changes in light, especially if you're painting at 3 8 p.m. Not 3 a.m. Gosh, that would be brutal. 3 p.m. Like I was, the light was just gone by, you know, not gone, but had changed by four because the sun sets around five. So I had to, real, I have to make those design choices later on, which you'll see me do. So I want to keep the uh, previous shadow that I had, which was not so much covering the painting, or do I want to kind of, kind of change it up and do a little bit of both, kind of bring the shadow in, but not to the extent that I see it. Um, so as a painter, you are making those design choices. So as you can see right now, I blocked in the majority of my rocks. And what I'm trying to do is also make sure that I get the value of those distant mountains out there correct. Because if I don't get that correct, uh, the atmosphere of my painting will be broken. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do you get atmosphere in a painting, especially with uh, landscapes like this when there's so much atmosphere I mean it's just it was literally blue those rocks are beautiful blue uh, sky blue uh, I love this color sky blue is a great color I love to mix with a little bit of a lizard and crimson to get those really beautiful atmospheric blues and it's not so much color as in value I could have a beautiful rich blue but if that rich blue is too dark in value it will completely break that atmosphere, the depth that I want to achieve in the painting. So first and foremost, to achieve atmosphere, my answer would be get your values right. And you will find that most of your answers lie in value first. I cannot stress enough how important that is to get your values right first. 
So you can see I'm slowly building along now and it's still pretty rough, I would say. I'm still figuring out a lot of things. Um, and I've switched back to my flat brush now. So at this point, I will really kind of alternate between the flat brush and the round brush uh, as I see fit. It is very intuitive for me. I don't really think about when I'm using. I just know when I need the round brush and when I need the flat brush. And like I said before, I will use a flat brush for starting off a block in, but then when I really feel like things need to be a little bit more lyrical and organic, I'll whip out the, um, the round brush to maybe just add a flare of a stroke, something that doesn't need to be so graphical, that needs a little bit of, let's say, destruction or messing up, right? Because you, in my opinion, I guess you have a little bit of less control in a way. It's, it's not as squarish and graphical. It won't make such a graphical stroke as a flat brush. So now you can see that in my highlights, I have a little bit more color. You can now start to see actually how the pink of the Le Pen sketch that I used is now beautifully seeping through and actually adds some nice warm, subtle pinkish warm vibrations in the highlights, which I'm liking right now and I will hopefully probably keep. Um, what I still need to figure out is really the, um, how I'm going to organize that chaos in the valley down below. There's lots of rocks going on, lots of, there's actually a river in the middle, uh, and which, yes, you can't see in them behind me, but there is. And that's going to be really tricky as well to get the values right and just hint that there is a river, but not really literally, you know, so much explain everything to a T. And I guess that's how I would say when I paint, I'm not really literally thinking about that's a rock, this is the next rock, this. I'm really trying to think of how everything exists in relationships. And I think about this for color, but I also think about this for shapes and for the subject matter. And um, sometimes, you know, you won't see the mistakes that you made. Like I think after I finished this painting, I didn't see that there's this weird kind of stroke that went down from the larger rock down to the valley. And I didn't like how that connected. That takes stepping away from your painting and really um, kind of almost getting a third eye to catch that stuff. So, I, I know right now I'm, I need to make sure that I, to heed that not all my highlights are kind of the same width. They're not all super skinny. They're not all kind of going the same in parallel vertical way. You know, even though maybe the actual subject matter will show me that me as a designer, or I as a designer, as a painter, um, I can take liberties to change that up, right? If I feel like those highlights, the rim light is too repetitive, maybe I can switch it up. Maybe I can take out a part of the highlight, put part of a rock completely in shadow, right? And that is where the hard part is, especially after you've done a really grueling uphill, constant uphill hike. It's like your brain just wants to turn off and you're like, no, you gotta fight. You gotta, this is not working, that's not working. That's why planar painting is so hard. And that's why part of it is just really fighting through. Uh, and of course, at the same time, not paying attention and not caring about the people hiking up behind you and stopping and watching you. You got to factor in all those things. So I'm thinking about all that. Um, right now what I'm doing, I guess I'm just blocking in a slightly darker value to start adding contrast on the bottom. And what I want to point out also is how I've really popped those burnt sienna and cadmium orange, subtle, uh, warmer tones or color in the shadows of those foreground rocks. You can see on the left and on the right. And you can kind of see it in the footage behind me. You can, these rocks, you know, even though they're so blue in the shadow, the rocks, the local color themselves of these rocks are so orange and reddish and you know so many different layers of color that can be very challenging to capture right um so so i'm trying to do that let's just say in the simplest way possible without overthinking it um because the last thing you want to do you know during planar is overthink it you're capturing color notes i'm never really trying to create a beautiful finished painting but i'm trying to capture and 
uh, basically put on canvas what I'm feeling from looking at this just gorgeous landscape in front of me. And I'm trying to just put that on this humble piece of paper. You know, if it comes out not, you know, super meticulous, but to me, it really carried the motion, I'm happy with that. So you can start to see I've switched back to the round brush now. And I'm just, you, it doesn't look like I'm doing anything, but I'm basically very slowly or sparingly dry brushing. And dry brushing is a technique that I love to employ. If you've seen my work before, it almost looks like oil because I'm really caking on that gouache paint, but also dry brushing uh, different warmer and cooler tones and colors to get those subtle color temperature shifts. And that is essentially one of my tricks that I love to do in gouache is dry brushing. And you can do that with either the flat brush or the round brush. So you can see my strokes are very minute, but all those minute strokes do something to help the painting just push a little bit further. All right, so let's dive in a little closer to the painting. So you can sort of start to see a little bit more of the color shifts that are going on. And hopefully it looks a little bit more interesting. <laughs> you can see now that I've blocked in the sky, um, just a very simple sky blue with white, um, nothing special in that. Um, and I've also kind of pushed those, valley, uh, those mountains in the back. Uh, the kind of the back rightish a little bit lighter. I kept getting those mountains too dark there, um, and I, I think I'm. I think I'm at this point. I'm kind of. I am liking where it is. Honestly, when I started this painting, I looked at what was in front of me and I thought, I'm not going to be able to paint this. This is too complicated. But I had hiked so far. I thought there's no way I'm not going to do a painting. So I have no choice but to give it a try. So I just sat down and started mooling away and. <laughs> I guess it was better than I expected, which is always nice. But um, yeah, so th there's an awkward stroke. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it now, kind of looking back at my painting. There's a sort of L-shaped, darker um, rock formation um, kind of in, in the center of the painting that I'm really not liking. And I think I break this up after camera. So I, I don't really quite catch it during while I'm painting because I honestly didn't step back enough. And that is something I should have done more and I failed to do. So a tip for plein air painting, because I was sitting down actually, I had my little chair out. So a tip for plein air painting is that if you are painting standing up, it's a lot easier to get up and not even get up. It's a lot easier to just step away and keep stepping away from your painting back and forth to assess if your painting, again, all the shapes, all the values, all the colors are working together in a holistic, harmonious relationship, right? Um, and that's really, really important. So you can see now I'm using the round brush to really just start really getting subtle shifts. Now, at this stage now, it's not about big drastic movements. It's kind of about kind of finessing and tweaking uh, little bits here and there. Now, obviously there's a lot more I could do after camera uh, uh, that, I, that I didn't catch, but it's about really slowing down now. And that's sort of the phases that I'll go through. I like to say that in the beginning, it's very fast. You know, you're trying to put down everything. I wouldn't say it's a race. Oh, well, it kind of is when you're playing or painting because the light is going away, but it's like, kind of like a graph where you know it's very fast and then it tapers it uh, it tapers so kind of like a I would say a a upside down U not really a U the U gets flattened out at the end very bad analogy but um, if you can picture what I mean um, so it's much faster in the beginning you're trying to block in all those shapes to in order to get a feel of how your whole painting is working as a whole so in the beginning, I'm mainly thinking about shapes, value, 
uh, my design, my, my, my line sketch in the beginning. And I'm thinking about blocking those all in to get um, the painting going. Now, towards the end, right, kind of more the phase right now, I'm slowing down and I'm thinking about edges, um, where I can infuse texture. And in terms of edges, I don't just mean, you know, soft and hard edges. It is interrelated though. I mean, I do mean, I do mean soft and hard edges, but also when I'm softening edges, that also means that I'm grouping some shapes together in a way. It can, it can mean that. So I'm thinking maybe where I have too many shapes, where it's fracturing the painting too much, maybe where I can simplify and group that more, or maybe where I need a harder, more defined edge to really get the structure and the boldness and the integrity of that rock to really push through. Right. So I'm thinking about those things and that's where it's really helpful to step back and see those things. And sometimes up close, you're like, oh, yeah, it looks OK. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. And you step where you're like, oh, that looks so mushy everywhere. And that could be a problem because of value. Probably you should check that first. Um, your shapes might be all too much the same size. So you're not getting a sense of depth or scale. Uh, it could be your colors are too saturated, right? You don't have enough neutral grays and fused in your painting. Or your colors aren't saturated enough and you don't have an area of pop in your painting that the eye can draw to, right? It could be one or the other. It could be both. Um, some areas of your painting could be suffering from one of those problems and another area of your painting could be suffering from another one of those problems. So as a painter, it's important to build up your skills to be able to assess what you need to tackle, right? It's never good to just give up. You're like, oh, great. This, this landscape was too challenging for me. Slow down. Think about incrementally. Okay. Is it value? Is it shapes? Is it my, is it my design overall? Usually I find for me, it's always design or value or in composition though. I always check design and composition first. And I always know when that is my, uh, faulting me because, um, colors i can fix colors i can figure that out design once you've kind of gone through like three-fourths of the painting gets a little bit harder to change that unless you're going to make very very bold moves um, so always make sure that you have a solid design first So let's talk about color a little bit more and now what I'm thinking of on this stage. So obviously the star uh, that I really wanted to capture was those rocks kind of starting in the mid left and then kind of moving towards the center and then to the right. Um, it was a beautiful kind of, what do you call it, line or wall of rocks. Um, so intricate so much going on um, but I was pretty much obsessed with the colors and the shadows because there's so much uh, blue from the sky going on and then but then there's these pockets of warmth that I wanted to capture and you can see in some areas I've actually popped the blue quite a lot um, you can see uh, in, in almost the center right underneath the the light shapes the, the rim light i pretty much put some sky blue with maybe a little bit of alizarin crimson and white uh, and then in some other areas in the darker areas in the bottom leftish i mix a little bit of alizarin crimson ultramarine and burnt sienna now that burnt sienna is the thing that will is a color that will really neutralize that purple um, and I kind of view it as sometimes I'll mix alizarin crimson and ultramine, which makes purple, and I'll mix yellow ochre as well because yellow and purple are complements. So I'll take any one of my yellows, depending on what the painting calls for, and kind of play around honestly with how, what kind of different, uh, more desaturated purples I can get for the shadows. And that's how I get more or less in a nutshell, those really interesting, subtle temperature shifts that I love to play with, especially in large masses of shadow. So you can see there's some areas where, again, I've popped some of that cadmium orange, and then some areas where I've popped kind of that darker, more desaturated purple. And then in some areas where I just wanted to pop that beautiful blue. I mean, if you, if, if any of you have been, see, been to Zion, you know, how blue, the, I mean, so graphic and so blue those shadows can get. And I really wanted to simplify that blue atmosphere in those background rocks, which is what I was just painting over just now to just see if I could again, layer another 
uh, layer of color to get that lighter value. And hopefully it will dry right this time, right? For those of you who have watched my other gouache videos or you've dabbled in gouache yourself, you know that gouache dries darker and I am not exempt from that problem. I actually deal with that problem still all the time and I just paint and that's partly why some of my paintings are very thick because I just kind of keep layering and layering, getting that value or getting that color that I haven't gotten and just searching for the right color. Uh, and so that is something with gouache that is a learning curve to, to definitely kind of get over. I also want to talk a little bit more about how I mix the shadow colors from my rocks and kind of the, I guess, the science behind it. So as you know, you know, the sky hitting the rocks, what I've noticed is that the areas of the rocks that are reaching closer to the sky, they will catch more of that cooler ambient light. And as you travel down the rock and it meets the ground, in this case, the ground is very green and luscious, but if the ground were sort of uh, maybe sandy or rocky, you would get so much of that beautiful orangey bounce light which is what you see a lot in Bryce Canyon. And I actually have another tutorial about me painting a plein air in Bryce Canyon, so make sure to catch that. But that is sort of how I observe how rocks work, and that's how you get those beautiful color temperature shifts, but maintain the same value. And this is a very important uh, point that I wanna touch on. A lot of times what people will do is they'll shift sometimes the values in their shadow masses too much. And once they start doing that, you start losing the, the sense of shadow and light, that split, the, the distinction. And once you lose that distinction, you've kind of lost readability in your painting. So how you achieve those really stunning shifts in your painting is to make sure that when you do color temperature shifts within a dark sh or a shadow mass and within a light mass, meaning a mass being hit by light, that the values are more or less the same, but you can still shift within saturation and within warmer and cooler colors, as long as the values are similar. So I hope that makes sense. So you can see in my painting right now, I'm shifting from cooler, sometimes cooler on the top, and then I hit maybe a little bit warmer with some purples, some reds mixed into blues, makes that a little bit warmer, right? Colors like purple and green actually have attributes of both warm and cool colors, right? For example, purple is composed of red and blue, and green is composed of blue and yellow. Blue is cooler, yellow is warmer. So that's how you can start to infuse those colors together to create a beautiful harmony. So now I've switched back to my round brush and you can see I'm just gonna start again going back and forth between my flat brush and my round brush just to see if I can get a little bit more variation and value in those back mountains as you can see, mixing those blues just a tad lighter with a little bit more white. Now, as you know, if you watched my other gouache videos, you need a lot of white. You can see I have a large tube in the bottom right there, 37 millimeters. And I should mention that I'm uh, using Windsor and Newton designer gouache paints and I'm painting on illustration board. But I didn't mention that in the beginning already. Cold press illustration board. So the, the round brush, as you can see, is great for just getting those really, um, airy brush strokes sometimes that you can't quite get with the flat brush because um, you just end up covering more surface area so using the tip of that flat brush uh, is is essential to learn and i always only use two brushes when i'm painting anything flat uh, one flat brush one inch and one round brush it's pretty much all i need especially for plein air because the last thing i want to do is just um, fuss around with my brushes and spend time choosing which one to paint where I, when I could just be painting, right? Uh, I have learned to use my flat brush through the front side, the corners, you know, the broad side, the, the thin side to get um, the tip to get railings or, you know, whatever you need be. And I've also learned to use a round brush to get cover more surface area or to get something as thin as a wisp of a line, right? So learning and learning the ins and outs of your brushes, I would say are very essential, right? Um, you know, your painting 
I would say, you know, it can be limited if you don't have the right brushes or you don't know how to use your brushes, right? Sometimes those technical things can get in the way of you creating a great painting uh, when you've only created a good painting, right? And so that is sort of the learning curve, like to say, after you've learned all the technical sides of, um, you know, your basics of primaries versus secondaries and how to use the brushes, how much water to use with gouache, how to control your use of gouache with water. Then once you have gotten those down under your belt, that is when you can really start to fly. Right? And that takes time and that takes patience. So you can see now that I've extended that shadow quite a little bit more. I kept kind of playing around and I really did like how there's a graphic shadow down there. And what I couldn't capture was this beautiful weaving river in the shadow in the bottom right corner. I just couldn't get the color or value right, so I kind of gave up on that. But right there, that shape that I'm touching right now, as a third person narrating over my video right now, I can see that L shape that is formed with the verticality of that rock and then this more or less horizontal area i don't like it so that is something design wise that i would have changed uh, if i had caught it on the site I, I don't know if i did but i know i saw it after i packed up and i and i thought ah dang you know again that's why it's important to step back so there was sort of like a, 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 a group of rocks there which is why i'm trying to paint it there but i realized that the shape of that horizontal ish rock was too similar in depth and, and width and length to the vertic vertical part and I think it creates a very weirdly stagnant area that kind of locks your eye right in the middle so I would say that's a very bad design thing a design choice I made on my part or negligence of design right and when I used to start up painting, I never thought about design. It was all about color and getting the emotion and, and getting the feel right, right? Very, very um, emotional. And as I continued down my painting path, I realized what made great paintings and amazing paintings stand out from okay paintings. And you really learn to analyze design more. And of course, that wasn't without the help of mentors along the way. Um, friends who taught me what to look for in a good design, um, you know, not having a stagnancy or, re or a, a boring picket line like repetitiveness in your paintings, right? We want to have a certain amount of repetition. Nature often presents us with that with, you know, similar groups of trees like sycamores, verticality, or a, gr a cluster of rocks that all have the same, you know, fall the same curvature. But it's our job, again, as artists to take that as inspiration and make it even better, right? So as you train your eye to catch these things faster, you will just get better as a painter. And I must admit that before this, I had not plein air painted in a while. That's probably why I, I didn't catch some of those things, right? Um, but I must say what I do like about my painting, if I can say so, is I do like those subtle temperature shifts I have in the shadows of the rocks. Um, and what I think that I could work on was really figuring out how to bring out the winding river in the middle and um, how to better uh, illustrate or I guess bring out those cluster of rocks in the valley, which I kind of didn't figure out, but honestly I was running out of time because the lighting was changing. So you can see uh, firsthand even me struggling in a plain air environment. And of course, it is, it is not easy. Now I will say at this point, when I've reached this stage, it is very easy to sometimes overdo things. Uh, and I'm not saying that overdoing is bad because you do learn from overdoing and you re and hopefully you learn from your mistakes and you go, oh, you recall that situation with that other painting. You go, oh, last time I, I know I should have stopped. So maybe this time I'm going to give it a break. I'm going to step away. I'm going to see if that painting really needs all that extra fuss with those strokes or it doesn't. For example, just now I just brushed in some lighter hints of highlight in the bottom uh bottom ish left corner of the painting and i don't think it needed that right it's very subtle but it already affects the painting in a way that it's too much for me and i think i should have just left that shadow mass just kind of more large larger like that not kind of fussing with it too much so 
I always go through these stage in my painting where I block in a painting. I really like how it's turning out in the blocking stage. I can see the potential. Then I always go through the struggling phase where I'm pushing through to push it from that blocking stage to the next, you know, the next potential. And that's always where the hardest part is. And then I maybe if I've kind of reached that point, then I sometimes start pushing it too far which again, I learn from it. Sometimes it's a good thing I push too far because I can see more potential, but sometimes I realize, oh, I didn't need to. And, and then it's always just that kind of, like think of a tug of war, right? One person on one end, it's like complexity versus simplicity, right? And one person's hugging complexity, add more, add more. And the other person's on the other end, oh, simplicity, gotta simplify this area. And you gotta decide, you gotta find that perfect balance in that rope, right? So that is always the challenge, I believe. Uh, and, I, and I really like that analogy because for me, it's really that analogy between um, simplicity and complexity in your shapes and your color shifts. You know, how simple you're going to keep your values. You, know, you can keep your values very simple. And value should be simple at its core, right? Three to four values at the most while you're playing with, um, you know, lots of temperature shifts. So it only gets harder from this stage. But with every planar painting that you do, you will get better as an artist. And I strongly believe going outdoors, learning from nature on the site itself is one of the best education, one of, one of, one of the best education you can get, that makes sense grammatically, you can get um, besides you know learning from online classes or watching other people paint, right? Go out there on your own and pick up those paints and paint because you're only gonna get better, you're only gonna learn faster, and it is just such a thrilling experience when you get it right. So this is about wrapping up the painting. I really hope you guys enjoyed watching me paint the six by six inch uh, plein air from Angel's Landing Hike at Zion National Park. So I wanted to share with you guys the final painting so you can see the textures and the paint strokes a little bit more up close. Uh, I do think personally this photographed a little bit lighter than the original. It just never looks the same as the original. I feel like you really have to see paintings with your own eyes because it never looks the same in a photo. Um, but you can see what I was talking about with those uh, warmer parts in the shadows with some slightly uh, cooler areas near the tops of the rocks. You can probably see where I use the flat brush uh, versus the round brush uh, with the different nature of the strokes. And um, yeah, you can see also, I didn't really figure out that L shape. I did break, up, break that shape up a little bit, but I probably could have done it more. But it was a planar painting and they aren't perfect. But here you have it is the final image. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. If you wanna check out my other videos, uh, check out my YouTube channel where I have a lot of videos on digital and gouache painting. Also make sure to follow me on my Instagram where I post the latest news, the latest artwork, and that's probably the one social media I keep most updated. And also make sure to check out my site, tiffanymang.com, where I have a lot of my gouache and digital pieces. And I also have a store where you can buy original gouache work, but also prints of my gouache and digital work from uh, fine art prints to canvas prints to wood prints, acrylic prints, you name it. I also have more videos on my Gumroad at gumroad.com Tiffany Mang Art. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at tiffanymangart at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching again. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Instagram, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye.